Welcome everybody here in Mountain View. Uh, today I'm pleased to introduce Adam Golinski and Marie Schweitzer. Adam is the Vikram S. Pundit Professor of Business and Chair of the Management Division at the Columbia Business School. He received his PhD from Princeton University. And Maurice is the Cecilia Yen Ku Professor at the Wharton School uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. He received his PhD from the Wharton School. Together, Galinsky and Schweitzer have published over 250 scientific articles and chapters in the fields of management, psychology, and economics. Their work has been cited in The Economist, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, The Financial Times, The New Yorker, National Public Radio, and more. Please uh, join me in welcoming them up to the, uh, the stage. Uh, great. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, I'm Marie Schweitzer, and uh, I'll speak for a little bit, and then I'll turn it over to Adam. And I'll say a few words about uh, our book and, uh, and some of the concepts in it. I want to think about Thanksgiving, and I want to think about what Thanksgiving means and what it feels like, uh, and, and the things around Thanksgiving that, that give us some insight into cooperation and competition. Our book, Friend and Foe, is about this duality where we're both cooperating and competing with people. And Thanksgiving is this quintessentially cooperative holiday. We get together with family. We celebrate the history of cooperation. And if there's, there's something else that's funny about Thanksgiving. Along with Thanksgiving, we've now come to associate Thanksgiving with the start of the, the holiday season, where we often see great sales that start that evening or very early morning of the next day. So we go from Thanksgiving, often having this, this, this meal, and depending on where you live or how you shop, um, people often go from dinner to the mall. And I want to tell you about one mall experience that happened in 2008. So this is 2008. Uh, we'll see people gather at a store. This was uh, the story I want to tell you about, about Walmart uh, in 2008 in White Marsh, where there was a sale that was happening at 5 in the morning. And people had gathered outside that store to get discounted prices on things like TVs and so on. And there were so many people that the staff had called the police to try to help control this crowd. The police had shown up, but weren't able to actually do very much. The, the crowd had posted a sign that read, Blitz line starts here. And they started chanting, tear the doors down. They're chanting this way. The, the employees of the Walmart formed a human chain to try to control the crowd. The crowd rushed in. They literally took the doors off the hinges as they came in. They ended up trampling people. And uh, Dumar here ended up getting trampled to death. Someone who had just celebrated Thanksgiving uh, ended up being the, the, the victim of this mob. What I want to think about is how we shift from cooperation to competition and back, and how we find our balance as we cooperate and compete. So our book um, talks about cooperation. So you think about parents ra raising an infant. They're cooperating. It's this, this intimate, incredible level. Uh, and even as they're the quintessential cooperators, they're also competing, often in that same domain, for things like who gets to sleep in, who changes the diaper, we're often cooperating and competing, even with the people very, very, very close to us. Now, it's not just, just parents. Uh, you think about siblings, what could be better than brotherly love? But also, sort of quintessentially, we have sibling rivalry. That is, sometimes our very the people very close to us are also the ones with whom we most intensely compete. And we might compete for things like you know, financial resources, but also things like anything that's scarce, like parental attention, uh, and so on. And there's a very special relationship uh, that I'll come back to, um, and that's, that's twins. And for twins, this idea of cooperation competition starts quite early. Uh, for twins, it starts before they're born. Actually, in the womb, they're both cooperating and competing for, for resources. In fact, uh, we were talking recently, and, and somebody told us about when they were watching the twins uh, just gestating, uh, one of the twins was kicking the other one. <laughs> Uh, you can sort of see that, that competition start really early. Now, at work, we need to collaborate. And so one of our challenges is how to figure out how do we do things like share knowledge, uh, collaborate as a group. 
So we're collaborating, but at the same time, uh, once or as we're going through that, we also need to balance competition. Who's going to get credit? Who's going to get promoted? Who's going to get a raise? So we're both collaborating and competing. We have to find our balance. So the, the central theme of our book is that we're cooperating and competing all the time, often with the same people. And we need to find our balance as we do this. And so what we'll do is we'll take you through a couple of ideas about the constructs that we consider that, that shift us between cooperation and competition and, and, uh, and back. So we're looking to find our balance. We could cooperate too much. We might make ourselves too vulnerable to, to exploitation. Uh, we could trust somebody too much and end up getting burned by it. But if we compete too much, we're going to miss out on opportunities to collaborate and expand the pie and end up uh, moving our team forward. Um, but if we find the right balance, we'll end up doing uh, the very best. Here's the first idea. Uh, we think about comparison. So if we think about things like, uh, do you make a good salary? Do you need to update your kitchen? Do you drive a nice car? Um, do I, is, is my workspace adequate? How are my kids doing? All of those judgments are really hard to to assess in the abstract. And instead, we make these relative judgments. So as we're looking for comparisons, as our mind almost instinctively races to comparisons, there's some individual differences that some of us do this more than others. But we're constantly scanning our environment to figure out, hey, how am I doing? How are my kids doing? Uh, what do I need? Um, and we make these comparisons. We might check Facebook. We might ask other people. Uh, we might try to figure out what's going on uh, to the you know, other people's kids around us. So it could be that our kids are playing soccer, and they're, they're, and they're young, and nobody keeps score, uh, except for the parents. The parents are keeping score. They know who scored the goals. Uh, they know which team is winning. Um, and so here, we're instinctively hardwired to make these comparisons. Uh, Larry Bird and Magic Johnson, for example, um, had a very special competitive relationship. The special competitive relationship is rivalry. When we have rivals, it's a really intense form of competition. Uh, and here, Larry Bird talks about the first thing I would do every morning was look at the box scores. Uh, he wanted to see what Magic did, and that, to him, was the most important thing. Now, here's what's good about comparisons. Comparisons can be powerfully motivating. We see something. Uh, we're comparing ourselves with somebody else. And we're motivated by that. And that can be really constructive. So there's a very healthy component to this. Right? So here's the good in comparisons. It increases motivation, can boost performance. And if we can harness cooperation in the right way, it can be very good. Uh, but there's some problems with comparisons also. And comparisons can make us not only more motivated, but can make us perfectly miserable. And I suggest that these are really hardwired. And I'll show you a short video about how hardwired they are. This is a study that Franz Duval did with Kachapin monkeys. Uh, these monkeys are really quite clever. And he taught them uh, how to use stones as a type of money. So they would use these stones. They'd hand them to the experimenter. And in exchange, get some reward. Okay. Now, now here's, what, here's what we're going to see. We're going to see a video of two Kachapin monkeys side by side. Uh, they both have stones. They're going to hand the stone to the experimenter. And they're going to get something. In one cage, one monkey is going to get cucumbers. And you could do this with monkeys. And they'll do this all day. They, they like to eat cucumbers. It's easy enough to hand the stones over. And they'll keep getting these cucumbers. The experiment he did, however, he put another monkey in the cage next to that monkey. And that other monkey, when they gave the stone, got a grape. Now, the grape's much better than a cucumber. Uh, and you'll see what happens. So if she gives a rock to us, that's the task. And we give her a piece of cucumber, and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us. And that's what she does. And she gets a grape. And she eats it. The other one sees that. Uh, and so what I'm suggest is that, uh, you know, is a stone worth uh, a cucumber? Well, it is until somebody else is getting a grape. Okay? 
So that is, you know, we could be very happy with our situation, our station in life. We could be happy with our salary until we find out somebody else is getting more. And that contrast can make us perfectly miserable. OK, so, uh, so here, uh, you know, what's, what's difficult about comparisons is they can make us miserable. They can increase resentment and spite. And we need to find our balance. Uh, and one way we do that um, is to differentiate ourselves. And, and the classic differentiation is among siblings. So I talked about siblings before. Uh, often, siblings will have very similar interests. But sometimes the comparisons become so aversive and grating that we find ourselves differentiating ourselves. So one, one sibling might be really great at school, uh, you know, great at math. The other one's like, oh, well, I'm really an athlete, or I'm the artist. And we find ourselves differentiating ourselves. The most intense comparisons happen with, with twins. And there have been a number of twin studies to really disentangle the, the differences between genetic and sort of social influences on how we, how we develop. Uh, and one really interesting thing about these twin studies is that you sometimes see twins that have been separated at birth, that grow up in completely different environments, and they end up with shockingly similar interests. Whereas often growing up, they might have similar interests, but they end up diverging. Uh, and here you find cases where um, you know, as people sort of balance this sort of motivation, resentment, and find their balance, you end up finding things like these twins, separated at birth. They grew up in completely separate families, different religions, different upbringings, but they ended up having identical interests. They were both 100% into fitness. And in fact, both of them owned bodybuilding gyms. Uh, and when they reconnected in their 40s, they were shocked at how similar they actually were. All right, I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to Adam to uh, continue. So I'll just, as a one sort of uh, transition, I'm a twin myself. And uh, my twin beat the shit out of me uh, in the womb. And we came out, I was 50%, he was 50% larger than I was. And uh, you know, when I was 12 years old, I ran a 10K race in 46 minutes, which is, I think, pretty good. My brother ran it in, in under 44. And so by the time I was 13, I was no longer a runner, but I was now a wrestler. So you can see how, how you can change those things. What I want to turn to next is, a, is another core topic of something that we naturally compare ourselves to. Um, when we think about what do other people have, we often think about this one dimension that really matters a lot, and that's power. And one of the key ideas that we develop in this book, and um, Maurice and I have been doing research on, on power and, and social hierarchy for over 15 years, um, almost 20 years now, is power is a structural variable. right? When someone has power, that technically what that means is they control an important resource that other people want, or they have a higher level of authority than other people. They can reward and punish other people. And that changes us in some dramatic and intense physiological and neurological ways. But the key insight that we develop is, is that structural level of power, why it matters is because it creates a psychological sense of power. And what really matters more than anything else is the psychological sense of power. Now, I want to just tell you briefly about a former student of mine. Um, she got her PhD at Kellogg, got a job talk at Harvard Business School. And what happens there is you come in and you do a 90-minute presentation on the faculty. And they have one job, which is to try to tear you down. So they ask questions. They try to like, find logical flaws. They try to catch you in discrepancies or inconsistencies. And she had a horrible experience at Harvard and felt really deflated and devastated. A couple weeks later, she got another job talk at London Business School. She really wanted to go to London. She had family there. It was very exciting for her. Um, and before her 90-minute presentation, they gave her an opportunity to spend some time by herself. And she said, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually use some of Adam's research and see if it helps me. And so she sat down for 15 minutes, and she wrote a little essay about a time when she had power. She really thought about this experience when she had power. And she went into London Business School interview and was in complete control of the whole room. She was answering questions. She was building off ideas. And she got the job. She has tenure at London Business School. She's very happy there. And so we tried to say, well, can I take, can we take Jillian's experience and test this? So what we did is we went to France. And there, people were applying to business schools. And what they had set up was a mock interview system for them where they could go in and have a mock interview and get that experience. Now, what they do is the judges tell them at the end whether they would have accepted them or not. So they get some feedback about that, and they, and they get some coaching, too. And we did a little experiment, but we didn't tell the judges we were doing an experiment. So they had no idea. But what we did is we randomly asked a third of the people 
to think about a time when they had high power, just like Jillian. We had a third of the people think about nothing. And then we had a third of the people think about a time when they had low power, right? Sort of, would that have a negative psychological sense on them? And what you can see in this data is a remarkable effect. The judges were told, on average, to accept about 50%. So say either you're, you're in or you're out about 50% of the time. And we can see here in the control condition, that's exactly what they did. But look what happened when people had simply thought about an experience they had in which they lacked power. Their interview performance plummeted. And now look what happened in the high power condition. It rose up. And what this research shows, and what the studies that we've done over the last 10 years, is that there's all this good in this psychological sense of power. It increases confidence. It increases optimism. One of the researches done by a professor at Berkeley out here showed that when you give someone power, their cortisol levels go down. Now, what is cortisol? It's a stress hormone, so you feel less stress. Other research have looked at brain activity. What gets active in the brain? Well, it's the approach and agentic centers of the brain get activated when you have power. So there's all this good in power. It makes the impossible possible. However, I want to do another little experiment with everyone in this room. What I want you to do is I want you to hold up your dominant hand with your index finger just like this. So everyone do this. And I want you, as quickly as possible, to draw a capital letter E on your forehead with your index finger. Capital letter forehead. OK, good. Now, it turns out there's two ways that you can draw this capital letter E. We did a little experiment like this. Um, one of the ways you can draw the capital letter E is like Maurice. This is what we call an other-oriented E. This is the correct E. The only reason to do an E is so it looks like an E to other people. Now, some of you, like this gentleman right here, drew what we would call a backwards E or self-focused E. It looks beautiful to me, but it's backwards to other people. Now, why does this matter? Well, we did a little experiment. We brought undergraduates from Northwestern University um, to, to experiment, and we took one person and said, you're in the high power condition. That means you get to control important resources. You get to decide what another person gets. And we told someone else, you're going to be in the low power subordinate position. Someone else is going to determine your rewards and what you get. And before they did an activity together, we separated them into other rooms. And one of the things we asked them to do was draw a capital letter E on their forehead. And look what we found. In the low power condition, almost no one drew a self-focused E. It was well, we're hovering around 10%. But look what happened in the high power condition. It tripled. Almost over 30% of people drew a self-focused D. So what does that tell us? It tells us something really important. Power reduces perspective taking. And in fact, I just told you about those brain studies which show that power activates the agentic parts of the brain. It turns out it takes away this other part of the brain called the mentalizing network, how we learn to understand other people. So what we need to do is we need to find the right balance between confidence, the good in power, and take away that self-focus so we end up with confidence and other focus. And I like to give a metaphor of driving a car. And now how do you get from San Francisco to Mountain View? Well, you need gas. You need acceleration. But if you drive that car without a steering wheel, not a, not a Google self-driven car, but a real person, <laughs> then you would crash into things along the way. And so we need, in power, we need to have acceleration, the confidence, and a really good steering wheel. So we need gas and a steering wheel. And one of the ways that we need to do this is to understand something that Maurice and I talk about, which is really important, the power amplification effect. What is the power amplification effect? Well, power, when you whisper, it can be heard like a shout. And I'll tell you just one very quick experience I had. I was an assistant professor at Kellogg, which means I have some power over PhD doctoral students. And, but I have less power than the full chaired professors who will vote in my tenure one day. And one day I saw a doctoral student, Gail, and I said, hey, Gail, can you come by my office at 3 o'clock this afternoon? I need to talk to you about something. Now, Gail walked into my office like this. She was crouched down. She was weary. She looked really concerned. And she's like, what, what do you want? And I was like, it was something so trivial I can't even remember what it was. And then she looked at me sternly and said, never do that again. I was like, do what? She said, never tell me you need to talk to me, because it scared the hell out of me. It's like I was thinking, did I do something wrong? Is he mad at me? And I was like, OK, Gail, maybe Gail's a little neurotic. you know." And I didn't think much about it. And then the next day, I get an email from my chair. And it says, hey, Adam, can you come by my office? I really need to talk to you this afternoon. And then I walked into her office just like this, like, oh my god, what's going on? What did I do? And then I realized this idea of the power amplification effect. Now, there's a good in the power amplification effect. When the powerful express gratitude, it has a bigger impact. 
Ironically, my research shows that the powerful are less likely to express gratitude, but it does have a bigger impact. But small criticisms or even silence get amplified and become deafening when they're done by power. Now, what's the solution here? Well, it's really easy. The first solution is basically tell them exactly why you need to talk to them. Or if it's too complicated, say, it's not a big deal, don't worry about it. Or if it is a big deal, you let them know it's a big deal so they can come prepared. Now, when we have high and low power people in a group, now we have hierarchy. And I want to tell you the final little topic I'll tell you about today, and then we'll, we'll answer some question, is um, when hierarchy wins and when it kills. When hierarchy is good, it's when it's bad. Now, many years ago, when Google got its start, they're like, we're engineers. We don't need any managers, right? We're, we can do this on our own. And it turned out there was a lot of chaos. Um, some of you probably know about Zappos has turned to this idea of holacracy, this, this vision of self-managed groups. And Tony Shea introduced holacracy, and he gave everyone an out. If you don't like your experience in the first couple months, on this day in April, tell us you want to quit, and we'll give you three months severance. Now, Tony Shea often gives people the opportunity to leave if they're not happy at Zappos. And historically, about 2% of Zappos employees have taken the deal. On this day in April, 14% of the firm left. And what happened is there was just, it was too hard to coordinate behavior. It was too difficult. And so what hierarchy provides is it provides a sense of coordination. Now to understand this, I want to ask you a simple question. Would you rather play a game with your best friend or your boss? Now, most people say, my best friend, I love my best friend. We play games together, right? But I want to tell you about this particular game. The game has two options. Option A is you get more points and more benefits, more lottery tickets than your partner. And option B is they get double what you get, right? So in option A, you get more. Option B, they get more. Now, to play this game, there's two rules. One is there's no communication. So you can't communicate with the other person. And two is you only get lottery tickets if you both choose the same option. Now imagine playing the game with your boss. You have option A and you have option B. Your boss thinks option B is what we should pick because I deserve more. And you're like, yeah, my boss does deserve more. I'll pick option B. We coordinate because of this pattern of deference. We both get lottery tickets. Now imagine playing with your best friend. You think, well, I don't want to be selfish. I want to be generous to my best friend. So I'll pick option B. And they're like, but I want to be generous. And then they pick option A, and you guys get nothing. Or you think, I'm going to be selfish because they're going to be generous. I'll state option A, but then they do the same thing, and again, you get nothing. So notice what happens is hierarchy or power differences allow us to coordinate our behavior um, uh, uh, in situations. And to highlight this, I want to take you back to a particular day in 2010 when a young man named LeBron James decided to take his talents to Miami. And what happened was they had a big celebration that first day. And on that celebration, the announcer said, let's welcome these new amazing free agents, Chris Bosh and LeBron James. It's Wade's house, it's LeBron's kingdom, and it's Bosh's pit. But it couldn't really be all three. And it was very clear, Bill Simmons, the great writer, said the day that, that they did this, it's like, I don't think it's going to work. There's going to be no pecking order. And he was right. Look at this. They couldn't win the close games. They were 29th out of 30 teams at the end because they didn't know who should get the ball. Is it Wade or James? How are we going to figure this out? Who's going to defer to the other? And they lost in the NBA Finals that year. The next year, Wade hurt his knee, became 40% of Dwayne Wade, and they solved the dueling banjos problem because of that, and they won the next one. So I want to show you some data. We collected 10 years of NBA data we coded how much talent there was in each team, and we looked to see how well teams performed. And we can notice here something really important. As teams got more talent, they did better, but only up to a point. After that point, there was actually a negative slope where too much talent became problematic. And I want you to think a little bit about why you think this is so true in basketball. It's because too much talent made it difficult for them to coordinate their behavior. And we know this. One of the things that happened when you got more talent is assists went down. The probability of making a shot when you've received the ball from a pass over when you've dribbled is double. It's a dramatic effect. And basically, the assists went down when they did this. 
Now, I want you to think for a second about if you can think of another sport where maybe we don't have a too much talent problem. We have a never enough talent problem, where more talent is always better. It's something that's a little different from basketball. It turns out that we also analyzed 10 years of another sport, which someone called an individual sport masquerading as a team sport. And that's baseball. And what we found is we just found it just went up and up and up and up. More talent was always better. And so you can start to understand that there's a good in hierarchy when we need to cooperate and coordinate our behavior. We need some types of, of thing. Now, I want to ask you another question is, as you can guess, I'm going to tell you the bad in hierarchy. What is the problem of hierarchy? Hierarchy helps us coordinate. It creates patterns of deference. It can be motivating because I want to move up the hierarchy. But what is the single biggest problem of hierarchy? Why, does sometimes, why can hierarchy also lead groups to fail, do you think? What does it do? Just one person's thought that drives the team. We lose diversity of thought. Hierarchy prevents less powerful people from sharing their perspective. I'm going to tell you two examples where this is the case. The first is a study that we did in the Himalayas. We took every expedition that's gone up the Himalayas in the modern era, over 100 years. 5,000 expeditions. And we analyzed what country did they come from? Did they come from a country that was very hierarchical or more egalitarian? We found if they came from a country like Korea, for example, that was very hierarchical, they were more likely to have people die on the mountain, presumably because they didn't feel comfortable low power people sharing their ideas. Here's another famous example, surgery. The single biggest problem we have in surgery is this, infections. An infection gets to the main line, it's catastrophic, and people die. What's the single best predictor of an infection getting to the main line? A doctor skipping a checklist point. So what we can see here is what they found is that nurses just didn't feel comfortable speaking up. There's such a power status gap between nurses and doctors that even when nurses saw the doctor skip a crucial step, they didn't force them to go back and do that step. So the bad in hierarchy is that it silences low power perspectives, which can lead to disaster. Well, how do we solve that problem? I'll tell you two examples. The first, let's go back to the surgery example. What did Johns Hopkins do to solve this problem? They gave the low power people a little bit more power. How do they do that? They said, you know what we're going to do? Nurses are in charge of the checklist. We're going to give them authority over the checklist. And that means they feel licensed and legitimated to say, doctor, we've got to make sure we do this step. And mainline infections went down, and lives went up. I'll give you a second example of this. So we want coordination. We want to prevent the science of low power. We want coordination with all voices. Now, one of the worst things we can do in a group is this, public voting. What happens when we vote publicly? We look to see what other people are voting. Who do we look for in particular? The high power people in the room. So one of the ways that we can solve this problem, we can get to coordination with all voices being heard, is by collecting information privately. And some people have developed apps. Here's just one app that I found called the Candor app, which allows people sort of to, in meetings, to express, um, to express things privately. So we're trying to get these benefits without the downside. Now, I'm sure everyone in this room has heard of a company called IDEO. Um, and IDEO as a product design firm, it's one of the, they created the first mouse um, for Apple. They created the free willy whale, for example. Um, and they have very particular rules to solve this problem. Stage one is idea generation. No hierarchy. And no one can criticize anybody's idea. Stage two is evaluation time. How do we do that? We do that anonymously with post-it notes. Stage three is implementation. Now we need the hierarchy to come back in because we need to coordinate people's behavior. We need to have someone overseeing who does what, when, and how. So what we've tried to do in this little conversation day is talk about that every relationship has an inherent tension between cooperation and competition. We don't want to tip too more towards cooperation or towards competition. And we're constantly oscillating back and forth. Now, if we can solve this problem, find this balance, all of our relationships are going to be better. The final key thing of this book is this. Knowledge is power. 
becoming aware that all of our relationships are beset by this tension in cooperation competition makes our relationships better off, right? Think about getting married, right? It's the time you come together, you collaborate with each other to form this more perfect union, and yet you're also competing over different aspects of the wedding. But becoming aware of this makes you navigate that minefield a little bit more effectively. I just got married actually four weeks ago, so, um, so I, I'm well aware of that one. Um, or collaborating on a book, co-authoring a book with someone. Once you become aware of that tension, it allows you to make choices. I want this, but I'm also aware they want that. How can we find the right balance um, between these forces? So the final thing that I'll say, um, uh, besides giving you some ways to stay connected with us, is I just want to tell you three other quick things about the book and then we'll answer as many questions as you have. The first thing um, is we have lots of topics. So here's one topic we talk about is how many gender differences that we might attribute to biology are really just power differences in disguise. And we talk about how women can lean in without getting pushed back and a number of different ways that the organization um, and other features can do that. We talk about how do we get people to trust us quickly, but how do we detect deception so we don't fall prey to their trust techniques. And if we misstep, how do we bring the pieces back together and apologize effectively? And then finally, we talk about when do we start our engines in a competitive interaction? Do I want to be the first one interviewed or the last one interviewed? Do I want to be on the top of a political ballot or farther down? Do I want to make the first offer in the negotiation or do I want to receive that first offer in the negotiation? And so we, we, it's a, it's, we take this lens a friend and foe, but apply it in lots of different ranges. So we're more than happy to answer some questions. Thank you guys so much. So I was curious about uh, any insight you have into comparisons under uncertainty. So specifically, you mentioned pay disparities, yeah, which yeah. Hot, hot in the press these days. Right. So when you have reasonable expectation that there is a difference or might be a difference, but no concrete evidence. Yeah, yeah. So we're constantly searching for, for, for evidence. And, and salary is a great exam, example. We're, it's very hard for us to assess how, how well we're doing on salary. We all have plenty of food to eat, um, but the comparison Especially at Google, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 especially here. Um, but we're, we're incredibly driven to figure out where we are in some, in some hierarchy. The, the information that we have is limited. And so one key idea to, to suggest is that um, we engage in these comparisons, we're searching for them, but we never have complete information, ever. Sometimes people will feed you information, and the information we get can be systematically biased. So in a negotiation, I might give you like, well, here are all the people that paid more for this car than you did. Uh, or we might look on Facebook and say, oh, well, how's my vacation? And oh my god, all these vacations look better. Right, because the really lousy vacation photos sometimes don't make it there. Uh, so, so we're getting systematically biased information as a matter of course, and it's for us to try to figure out how to, how to navigate that. Now, as managers, uh, there are a few things that we can do. That is, um, we, might, we might describe ranges of salaries that people are getting, rather than making complete disclosure of like, OK, here's how much everybody else is getting. I mean, we see this at, at a universities. Public universities have to post salaries, and that can make people perfectly miserable. Whereas private schools, so like at Northwestern, for example, they just they do the 25th percentile of all associate professors in the Kellogg Business School, and they also do the 75th percentile. So you can see sort of you can assess where you are, but you don't know. I don't know what my colleague is exactly getting. Um, but but your question is also really important because. Um, one of the things that we talk about in the chapter about gender is one of the single best predictors of reducing gender disparities is having accurate information. And so the United States, for example, had an executive order of more transparency in what were the rates of promotion by gender, for example, and they showed an increase. Australia, what they did is they decided that every company that reported to the Australian Stock Exchange had to release information both about promotion rates but also how they went about selecting people for different jobs and promotions. And the number percentage of women went up 50% within two years um, in, in management roles. And so, so one of the things is, you know, we talk about is transparency is actually one of the helpful things for reducing some of the biases that exist in the world. Somehow we didn't answer your question. No, 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 but it's a little bit at odds. 
because you've also said some kinds of transparency yeah. make people yeah. perfectly miserable. Yeah, miserable. So, yes. So, so, where, so I think I think what's really important is to have uh, procedures in place. Um, you want systematic procedures. You want a transparent system, and that's really important. Uh, and and we want to think about making broader structural changes. There's, there's some problem. That transparency can be really helpful in fixing problems. Individually, the transparency of how much people are making that that can make people yeah. just crazy. I think the like if I know what every individual wants, but but you know when Walmart was here with their class action suit, one of the things that happened was. You know, you might say, oh, women have less experience than men, that's why they're getting paid. It actually turned out women had more experience than men and they were still getting paid less. And so just, I don't know exactly what this particular man or this particular woman makes, but having some assessment actually is really important for, in that sense. And in the same way that I prefer Northwestern system of letting us know the 25th and 70th percentile more than knowing what each colleague in my department makes. So you mentioned that um, praise from your higher ups is more valued, but it's more scarce. Um, so if it was more common, would it still be valued as highly? Yeah, so it's a great question. So I think that, you know, um, you can just oh, hold oh, on to it. Um, yeah. uh, I think that, so we know that scarce things are more valuable. And we also know that things that come from high power people are more impactful. I think that there is one element of that scarcity, though I think that some of the, some of the research shows that even high power people who praise frequently, um, it still has this huge impact. It's especially impactful, though, when high power people praise in a descriptive rather than sort of a general way. Like saying, what you did today was fantastic, you know, is really great, rather than like, oh, you're doing a great job, right? And so the more descriptive, Feedback in general, the more descriptive it is, the more valuable it is. And that amplification effect gets even more amplified than in that case. But it's a great question, because you have these competing variables, scarcity and the high power aspect. So uh, given a choice between cooperating and competing, this sounds very similar to the classical prisoner's dilemma, where lack of communication is leading to a person having to decide whether to compete versus cooperate. Do you guys have any idea where where or how could we change a competition into a cooperation? How, how do you enable that yeah. at all? Yeah, so, so there are a couple of ideas here. One is uh, we can think about structurally, if we start cooperatively, we signal our, our intentions, that can get us off on the right foot. And in a lot of our interactions, we can do this by you know, one on one interactions with things like non-task communication. So, so we don't get right down to business. We chit chat first. We talk about sports or the weather or something else. Uh, now, more, more broadly, if we have a really competitive person, the best way to transform a very competitive person into a cooperative person is to put them on a team and have them compete with some other team. Or we think of you know, one organization, we're competing with some other organization, uh, and that can get somebody who's really competitive. And now, as soon as they say, oh, no, we're competing with somebody else, now they're incredibly intensely cooperative. And I think structurally, the other thing that you can do is we can change the very nature of the game. So the, one of our favorite studies, I, I know Maurice loves this study too, is um, they took the prisoner's dilemma, didn't change any aspect of it. So it's the same you know, typical point. There's this conflict between cooperation and competition, but the incentives lean towards competition. And they just told people, we're going to have you play a game today. It's called the Wall Street game. And then people just went straight to the competitive decision. Or they said, we're going to have you play a game today. It's called the community game. And then people were much more likely to choose the cooperative choice, even though the incentives hadn't changed. So some of the ways that we can do is you know, we can create that external enemy, which is great. Other ways we can change the nature of the task and how we describe it um, as, as, as another example of doing that. And I think, as Maurice said, one of the best ways is path dependence. Start with cooperation. If you go back to Axelrod, and you came up with the, the, the famous the thing that beats all other prison dilemma games of all is called tit for tat. How does that work? You start by cooperating. You cooperate as long as the other person cooperates. As soon as they detect defect for the first time, you switch to defection. You keep defecting until they go back to cooperation, and then you go back to cooperation. And that showed over it beat every other possible strategy that existed in the world in the prisoner's dilemma. So most important thing is start cooperation, come with the right labels, community game, not Wall Street game, and come up with external threats that you can come back together on. Hi. So I'm wondering about um, 
is there a clear distinction between competing and being aggressive? And also, maybe slightly d differently, um, what ha have you any insight into, say, the problem of um, sort of social fairness towards people uh, who perhaps culturally, you know, maybe like the stereotypical geeks or whatever, who are less likely to compete? Yeah. So, I mean, culturally, uh, so, so I, I talked about fairness. Um, the idea about comparisons and fairness uh, seem to be very hardwired. So I showed you evidence from catchment monkeys. Um, it's true here in the United States, uh, and it's true internationally. Uh, there's, a fun, there's a fun parable. It's a Russian parable um, about a man who finds a lamp, rubs the lamp, a genie appears, and says, I can grant you any wish you want. The condition is your neighbor gets double. So he paces back and forth. He thinks really hard about this problem and finally says, oh, I know what I want. I want you to poke out one of my eyes. <laughs> what I want to suggest is that, that for, for many of us sort of very broadly, uh, we have this, this intense comparison and competitive drive. Now, some, some of us aren't as assertive or aggressive as we can be. And here I think you know, Adam's research was talking about the power priming. When we think of a time that we had power, we psychologically feel like we have power, and that gets us to approach problems and be more assertive. Uh, I think you know, one of the ways that we solve this problem, we talk about this in the um, when and how to start your engines chapter, is how do you make an ambitious first offer that also signals cooperation? So how do you anchor the negotiation in your direction, so you're being competitive, but you're somehow signaling cooperation to the other side. And there's actually a technique that we've created that's incredibly effective, which is what I do is I offer you a choice among offers. So I say, look, here's two or three offers. I'm indifferent between them. You pick the one that's best for you, and we can make a deal right now. So let's say you know, you're, you're, you're going with cars. You're like, I gave you this car in this color with this mileage, you know, used car. Or I could give you this car in a different color with some different mileage. Um, and I'm going to give you the same price for both those cars. You just pick the one you like the most. Now, we may be anchoring the negotiation in our favor, but because we're giving you a choice, we're signaling cooperation. And so our research has shown that people walk out being like, that was a cooperative, flexible person. But we showed that by doing that, I actually got a much better deal than I would have if I had just given you one offer. So, so intensity, um, so, so intensity will, will be different. So, so I don't want to suggest that the cultural differences aren't important. Our cultural differences are very important, and they will guide very different behavior, like, like Adam's research on talking about the Himalaya Mountains expeditions. Mm -hmm. so, so culture matters for sure. Uh, what I am saying is that a lot of these principles are so profound, that is, they're hardwired into the architecture of our brains, all of us engage in comparisons. Now, some of us are crazy about it. So some of us check Facebook all the time. We're constantly monitoring what people are doing, how they're doing it. And some of us kind of skate through life caring less about it. What I am suggesting is that all of us care about it. And these comparisons give us meaning. We can't get away from them. And so they're, so they're hardwired. But, but there are definitely individual differences and cultural differences. Yeah, and I think two just other quick things to say about that. One is what we compare is going to depend partially on culture. So, you know, in some cultures, you know, the car that you drive has a huge impact on how people treat you and, and I want to have a better car than my, my neighbor. And so the car is a big distinction. Other people it might be what technology, like what phone you have. Do you have the latest, greatest um, phone, Android phone, for example, not the iPhone. Um, but, um, <laughs> but uh, you know, so, you know, things like that can, can make a big difference. So, so context and culture really alter, alter those um, dynamics. And I think one of the things, like with power, is power exists in every society, um, but it plays, um, it has some sort of slightly different effects depending on the society. So how those patterns of deference play out and when they matter. Um, and the, you know, for example, the power amplification effect is even stronger in some East Asian cultures than it is in American cultures. Criticism by a boss is so painful in some cultures. Um, you know, stories of people committing suicide just because they're criticized in a meeting, you know, that seems hard to believe from our culture. Even though we're going to have the same impact, the intensity is going to be greater in some cultures than others. So it's a great question. I learned that from Sachin. You always say, that's a great question. So, so yeah. 
um, as, as you both are business school professors, do you also infer changes to how people should manage their companies, how HR systems should be set up, performance evaluation, things like that? Do you have transfer these findings? Yeah, I mean, yeah, interesting. Uh, we're actually working on a, on a, on a piece right now um, talking about diversity training programs. Uh, a lot of diversity training programs, for example, fail. So simply raising awareness sometimes isn't enough. We need to think about more systematic approaches for mentoring and so on. Uh, when it comes to the, the kind of feedback that we give people, so the feedback systems should be different. Uh, when it comes to the way we share information about salary information. Uh, so, so there are a lot of direct applications for these ideas, and they should they should guide managerial action and, and corporate policy. And I also think you know, the finding the right balance with hierarchy is so important, right? We know the absence of hierarchy leads to chaos. You know, and one of the things that we, we were giving this talk yesterday at Zillow, and someone pointed out that a friend worked at a company where they tried not to have any managers. And what that really means is nobody does the jobs that nobody wants to do, right? Because you know, no one does it. it and so you need someone who says, well, OK, you have to do this job. We have to get this done. You need some people control. But we don't want to silence you know, low power voices and prevent innovation. And so you need to find some that balance between coordination and, and silencing low voices. And what's that level? I'm not a fan of holacracy. I don't think that's a very good people management strategy. I think it'll probably fail um, in the long term. Um, because just as Google needed managers, you know, not just engineers, is that we need to have some sort of sense of coordination mechanisms and devices that, that get into play. Um, but I think one of the things that HR need, need to recognize is how do you find that right balance? Another example, just really briefly, is you know, team rewards versus individual rewards. right? You know, and the research shows if you just have individual rewards, you get competitive behavior. If you just have team rewards, you get social loafing. You know, so you need to have some combination. What's the exact combination? That's a tougher question to answer, but some combination of rewards that tie people together but still motivate individual performance. You're going to ask a follow-up. Yeah. Do you know a company that gets the hierarchy thing right? Um, well, I have to say Google, of course, gets it perfectly. But um, uh, it's uh, uh, <laughs> You don't think uh, so. Um, you know, I think, I, I think you know, there, there's, I mean, I think a lot of the, yeah, successful companies are, are doing this. I mean, I think a lot of the Silicon Valley companies are, have been successful in trying to find that right balance. And I think some of them, I think like Zappos, have tipped too far towards one direction. You know, we just, we just spoke at Microsoft the other day, and I think some people felt, you know, Microsoft might have tipped too far towards, you know, hierarchy level and too much sort of individual awards and competitions around that, too. And so it's, it's tough to find that yeah, balance. Yeah, let me, let me just offer one, one other example to sort of uh, suggest that there's a constant struggle. Uh, if you look at the military, uh, the military yeah. is this classic hierarchical structure. So we have a lot of different ranks, and you have to follow orders. Um, and for many tasks um, that just require people to do things that they don't want to do, you need strong hierarchy that moves people in a very coordinated way. And yet, for new challenges, you think about the special forces. And the special forces, they've broken down that hierarchy. Uh, and there, it's much flatter. You have very different rules. People can speak back to their boss. They can disagree. Uh, and, and here, within the same organization, they've created very different hierarchical structures to tackle different kinds of problems. So the nature of the task needs to fit the hierarchy. And notice that you know, something else about the special forces is they tend to be smaller groups. right? As these groups get bigger, you need a little bit more some type of mechanisms of control. But when you're going in and you know, you're a 20-person team, it's a little bit easier for you to, to handle those situations. And so I, I think that that's, a, that's another great example of it. Um, so I had a question. I, a few months ago, read Adam Grant's book, Give and Take, which I assume you both are somewhat familiar with. Um, basically, he says there are givers, takers, and matchers. And if I'm remembering correctly, when interacting with a quote unquote taker, the people who are really successful are those who basically stop giving to that person until they become a matcher, so to speak. So in applying it to this, I'm curious if, assuming that you can't create an external enemy or anything, uh, if someone is a super competitive person, isn't it better to adjust and to also be pretty competitive back to that person until they become a little bit more middle of the road? And that's exactly the tit for tat thing that I mentioned. That you know that the single best strategy for uh, prisoners' dilemma is signal cooperation. Cooperate if they compete, compete with them until they're willing to go back to cooperation, and, and then you switch back. And I and I think that's right. I think that 
the one thing that really, I think, changes the very essence, and Adam Grant's book is great, and, and you know, obviously he's a colleague of Maurice's and know him very well, wrote a blurb for the book. Um, but I think what really, what our book is fundamentally different about this is this idea that we don't just have givers and takers and matchers, is that in every relationship, there's this tension between cooperation and competition. And we have to be aware of that. And we have to ask ourselves, how do we find the right balance? So I'll just give you one example. Maurice does this great thing in his negotiations class where he, you negotiate every week. And you have to write down the little thoughts about like, your negotiation. And then about halfway through the class, he says, OK, what I want you to do is I want you to go back and read your first five or six weeks. And I want you to ask yourself this question. Am I cooperating too much? And am I getting exploited in the negotiations? Am I competing too much consistently, so maybe I'm killing joint gain and expanding the pie? Or am I finding the right balance? And if we're over here, how can I get over here? Right? If I'm too far this way, how do I get back to here? And I think that reflection is really important, as is a lot of it's about this sort of self-understanding of that tension and trying to find the, the right path. And I, I see Sachin just looked at his watch, so I think we have time for one more question. Yeah. So um, I'm seeing a lot of a discussion where it leads to like a 50-50 harmony, but how does the cooperation competitive, competitive, competitive competition versus co uh, compet cooperation, there we go, um, affects in terms of like innovation? I feel like we don't talk much about innovation, you talk more about like, just keeping the peace. Well, I've spoken 53% of the time, so I'm gonna let Maurice answer that question <laughs> to make it more 50-50. Well, well, for that, I mean, it, it, it's funny because you mentioned innovation. Uh, um, with that innovation, the, I mean, that's where we want to break down hierarchy to sort of free these ideas. And, and Adam was talking a lot about uh, examples from, from idea where when we're generating ideas, we want to remove criticism. Now, here's one idea. Ironically, we actually want some rules. We want rules about no interruptions, no criticism. With those rules, we can actually set ourselves freer to explore ideas to be more creative. Um, and we want to separate the idea creation stage from the idea criticism stage. And the New York City Fire Department, for example, when they're trying to implement or come up with new ways of fighting fires, they want people from all different ranks and part of the organization. When they come into those conversations, they're not allowed to wear their uniforms. Because all of a sudden, rank becomes such a big, compelling force. And we really want people to feel comfortable sharing ideas. Um, but the single greatest way for you to find this right balance between cooperation and competition and innovation is buying three or four copies of the book and getting us to sign it. So, <laughs> so that's really the key thing to the whole thing. So well, thank you guys so much for uh, coming thank out. We're, we're happy to sign uh, the book and everything. Too.